Hello everyone, happy Easter. Today is April 12th, 2020, and we are uh, reflecting on time from the prayer recollection with Luke 21. We're actually uh, taking the whole chapter. Didn't exactly do that on purpose. I overlooked the fact that the first few verses are a separate section. <laughs> I did the whole thing together thinking it was one section, but um, it's not, but that's okay. Here we go. This is So this is a longer reading get comfy. While Jesus was in the temple, he watched the rich people dropping their gifts in the collection box. Then a poor widow came by and dropped in two small coins. I tell you the truth, Jesus said, this poor widow has given more than the rest, more than all the rest of them, for they have given a tiny part of their surplus. But she, poor as she is, has given everything she has. Some of the disciples began talking about the majestic stonework of the temple and the memorial decorations on the walls. But Jesus said, The time is coming when these things will be completely demolished. Not one stone will be left on top of another. Teacher, they asked, When will all this happen? What sign will show us these things are about to take place? He replied, Don't let anyone mislead you, for many will come in my name. I am the claiming, I am the Messiah, and saying, The time has come, but don't believe them. And when you hear of wars and insurrections, don't panic. Yes, these things must take place first, but the end won't follow immediately. Then he added, Nation will go to war against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes, and there will be famines and plagues in many lands, and there will be terrifying things and great miraculous signs from heaven. But before all of this occurs, there will be a time of great persecution. You will be dragged into synagogues and prisons, and you will stand trial before kings and governors because you are my followers. But this will be your opportunity to tell them about me. So don't worry in advance about how to answer the charges against you, for I will give you the right words and such wisdom that none of your opponents will be able to reply or refute you. Even those closest to you, your parents, brothers, relatives, and friends, will betray you. They will even kill some of you, and everyone will hate you because you are my followers. But not a hair on your head will perish. By standing firm, you will win your souls. And when you see Jerusalem surrounded by souls, then you will know that the time of destruction has arrived. Then those in Judea must flee to the hills. Those in Jerusalem must get out, and those out in the country should not return to the city. For those days will be days of God's vengeance, and the prophetic words of the scriptures will be fulfilled. How terrible it will be for pregnant women and nursing mothers in those days. For there will be disaster in the land and great anger against the people. They will be killed by the sword or sent away as captives to all the nations of the world. And Jerusalem will be trampled down by the Gentiles until the period of the Gentiles has come to an end. And there will be strange signs in the sun, moon, and stars. And here on earth, the nations will be in turmoil, perplexed by the roaring seas and strange tides. People will be terrified at what they see coming upon the earth, for the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then everyone will see the Son of Man coming on a cloud with, great, with power and great glory. So when these things begin to happen, stand and look up, for your salvation is near. Then he gave them this illustration. Notice the fig tree or any other tree. When the leaves come out, you know without being told that summer is near. In the same way, when you see all these things taking place, you can know that the kingdom of God is near. I tell you the truth. This generation will not pass from the scene until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will disappear, but my words will never disappear. Watch out. Don't let your hearts be dulled by carousing and drunkenness and by the worries of this life. Don't let that day catch you unaware like a trap, for that day will come upon every, everyone living on earth. Keep alert at all times and pray that you might be strong enough to escape these coming horrors and stand before the Son of Man. Every day Jesus went to the temple to teach, and each evening he returned to spend the night on the Mount of Olives. 
The crowds gathered at the temple early each morning to hear him. Okay, this one is definitely a doozy, and there is so much that I don't understand about this. I think that I would have to read from great scholars for a long time to grasp this. And I also know that, or at least I've heard, that the nature of prophecy is often that um, you really can't understand it until it has been fulfilled. And then when it is fulfilled, it's often it often happens in a way that you didn't think it was going to. So the people who had the prophecy, sometimes it's hard to see that it is actually happening um, or has happened. And that's part of what happened to the Jewish people when Jesus came. So, um, but um, I'm just going to do a few um, reflections from my reading. I'm not going to go deeper unpack any of this because I can't. I don't get it. Um, I know that some of it's talking about the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem that happened in 70 AD, but it also seems to be talking some about the end times when Jesus will come again. Um, and I can't, I don't, I can't pull all that apart. So um, let's just take a quick peek at the first section um, about the widows. And I, um, I like where it says, for they have given a tiny part of their surplus. But she, poor as she is, has given everything she has. And I think it's really cool that, um, and sobering, that Jesus is calling us again to give everything, that that's what this life with him is about. And I just pray that that's what my life will be. It's literally about everything in my life belonging to him, and that I'm only stewarding that and completely willing to sacrifice it for whatever purpose is his purpose. Um, then let's look at verse 14. It says, so don't worry in advance about how to answer the charges against you, for I will give you the right words and such wisdom that none of your opponents will be able to reply or refute you. Um, so I think this is referring to, um, how the early Christians were going to be, have accusations brought against them and persecutions. And I think it's really cool that Jesus told them that this would happen so that they weren't surprised. But at the same time, he also told them not to worry in advance about what answers they needed to give because the Spirit would do that for them. First of all, I think that's very cool because that's just like Jesus, that he was able to have the right words and such wisdom that his opponents weren't able to reply or refute him. Um, and I also think it's cool that he told them not to worry about what to say in advance because it's not our our eloquence or our words it's the work of the Holy Spirit that makes it powerful and um, you know I think if that had been me if I knew that was coming I would be tempted to start trying to plan out well what am I gonna say and what if they say this and what if they say that and um, I love that beautiful sense of trust that he's going to provide the words you don't need to spend any energy worrying about that that's very cool then in verse 20 it says, And when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then you will know at the time of its destruct you will know that the time of its destruction has arrived. Then those in Judea must flee to the hills, those in Jerusalem must get out, and those outside the out in the country should not return to the city. So um, I think this is a cool gift that Jesus gave them this prophecy about the fall of um, Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple. I was reading a little bit in my commentary. I'll show it to you. Um, this is the this is my paper Bible that I use. Okay, let's get the, the NLT study Bible. I like this. It has a nice commentary in it, but it's not a really deep commentary. It's just um, you know a few notes on some of the verses. Um, there are obviously much more thorough commentaries, but. I think that one is well done for an in-Bible commentary. Um, one of the things that said was that when this, when Jerusalem was attacked and taken over, that the fact that Jesus had provided this prophecy about that happening saved many of the Christian, um, Christian Jews because they knew this was going to happen and they knew they had to get out because they knew Jesus' prophecy about it. Um, and I think that is a really cool gift that he gave them. I think a little bit about that now when we are um, 
told to shelter in place here for coronavirus. It's, we're not quarantined, but it's a little bit like that. Um, and so I can imagine now um, a little bit more just kind of what a national emergency is like. It would be nothing like this, of course. Um, we're not supposed to leave our homes for anything other than essential purposes. You know, they were told they couldn't go back to their home. I can almost imagine that, you know, um, and how hard that would be to know it's happening. Don't even go home. Don't go get your stuff. Don't go get your loved ones. Don't go do anything. Stay out. If you're there, get out. And that as awful as that would be, that actually would have been much better than staying under the horrors and the tyranny that Jerusalem was about to experience. Um, so that was a really cool gift that Jesus gave them that prophecy. Uh, last reflection is from verse 37 where it says every day Jesus went to the temple to teach and each e evening he returned to spend the night on the Mount of Olives. The crowds gathered at the temple early each morning to hear him. I love this. Um, I'm not sure I understand it, but the way that I read this is that he's going to the Mount of Olives basically for solitude every night. Um, I'm assuming that he's literally out outside on the Mount of Olives. Not, you know, maybe he knew someone who lived there and that's why he was going there and he had a bed. I don't know. Maybe he had the equivalent of a tent. I have no idea. <laughs> but I'm taking it to be that he was having time focused time with God to regenerate himself spiritually every night and to solidify that connection. And then early in the morning, they, I'm, I read that as they were already gathered when he got there. But when he came, he came well fortified because he had been with God. And um, I think if Jesus, who was a deity and the son of God, needed to spend that time in solitude and silence how audacious it would be for me to imagine and I, as i have imagined for many years that i don't need that and um so i'm really trying to make that change in my life um and i think this is a very powerful example and i praise you for this jesus